This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. I hope you all had a wonderful Halloween, and I hope you're also having a great week. If not, fear not. I'm here to whisk you away for a little while. Our first story this week is just so great and so scary, and I'm so happy that the author gave me permission to read it. This is by a very talented author named David Farrow, who actually has a great supernatural book out called The Neverglades. If you like the story I'm about to read, then I highly recommend you check it out. I will link it in the show notes along with all of his other links. This story is called Painted Black. See, here's the thing. When you grow up in a haunted house, You get so used to weird that it becomes your new normal. That door swinging open on its own, those lights flickering for no reason, that shadow lurking in the corner of your eye. That's just how it is. You don't know there's anything wrong with it because you're just a kid. You take everything at face value. The things you see every day would drive men twice your age insane, but for you, it's all you know. That's why I wasn't scared of the eyeless lady, even though her face was all wrinkled and cracked, like my dear old Nana's except without any color. She only came in the middle of the night. I'd open my eyes and she'd just be sitting on the end of my bed, running her withered hand along the blanket. She always wore the same blue dress and flowery hat. She'd stare at me and smile, except she couldn't really stare because She had two voids where her eyes should have been. I asked my parents who she was one day, and it scared my mother so bad that she shattered her coffee mug on the kitchen tiles. That set my dad off, like so many things did in those days. And then he started shouting, and she was crying, and I was just cowering in my bowl of cornflakes and hoping they'd ignore me. My sister Bethany had hightailed it into the den, the second the volume got too loud. She was two years older and used to this song and dance by now. I wanted to join her, but I was afraid they'd start shouting at me, too. So I just sat there and waited it out. Bethany never saw the eyeless lady, but she had a ghost of her own. A boy with no hair who would stare into her bedroom sometimes. She never told Mom and Dad because she knew better, But when it was late at night and neither of us could sleep because of the house creaking and moaning around us, she'd slip into my room and tell me stories about the boy with no hair. His head was like an egg, she said, big and gray and round and cracked at the top, with a little blood seeping out of the crack. He didn't have ears and his nose was a little nub. He'd stand outside her window and put his hand on the glass and stare at her, And sometimes, he would tap, once or twice, like a hummingbird on a tree trunk. But he never tried to open the window or get inside. She was grateful for that. She told me she was scared of the boy, that she couldn't sleep with him standing there. And when she did sleep, she had nightmares about him. I told her that everything would be okay. I told her that the eyeless lady would take care of us, if the boy with no hair ever got inside. Bethany called me stupid. She said she would just run away if she wasn't so worried about what would happen to me here without her. I said that the boy with no hair was out there and she was safer in here with us. She just stared at me and said it wasn't safe in here either. But she left before I could ask what she meant. There was another ghost, too, and this one was everybody's ghost. I couldn't tell you if it was a man or a woman, 
a child or a grown adult. It was always in your periphery, so you'd never get a real good look at it. The air felt hot when it was around, and lights would blow out with no warning. Tempers got fiery, too. You could tell the ghost was nearby because Mom had a tendency to get all sweaty and snap at us for no reason. Dad thought it was a home invader at first, so he took a fireplace poker and stormed through every room in the house looking for an assailant that wasn't there. But of course, he never found a thing. The shadow ghost, as I called it privately, became an obsession for him. Sometimes I'd wake to find him wandering down the hall in his pajamas. A kitchen knife, or a beer bottle, or a baseball bat clenched in his hands. I never let him know I saw him. I didn't want to see those household weapons up close and personal. The four of us lived in that house for most of my childhood. But everything changed when Dad was found dead in the kitchen one morning. Bethany came across him, lying on the floor before she could head off to school. He had a knife in his left hand and black, charred marks all the way down his arms and neck. He'd always been a big man, but he looked small in death, fragile. His eyes were open and scared and bloodshot, as if he'd died of fright. That wasn't the real cause, of course. Forensics thought it was a suicide that he'd stuck the knife into a wall socket and electrocuted himself. Bethany and I knew better. Dad had antagonized the shadow ghost one too many times, and it had finally turned on him. The scorch marks told me everything I needed to know. Mom was understandably shaken, and her first step was to get us out of the house. She made us pack our bags and leave as soon as the coroner had taken the body and the cops had vacated the scene. She told us the wiring in the house was faulty and we couldn't stick around or we'd get shocked to death too. Bethany and I knew she was really afraid of the shadow ghost. Its presence had taken a toll on mom over the years, worn her down physically and mentally. It had wrinkled her skin with worry lines and placed permanent bags under her eyes. I knew at that point in my life that the ghosts weren't the only things to blame for mom's transformation. But dad was gone now, his own lurking presence exercised, and there was nothing to keep her in this place anymore. So we left, took our things and found a cheapo motel out of town and stayed there until mom could sell the house. I kept waiting for the eyeless lady to appear at the foot of my bed. But she never did, and over time I almost convinced myself that I'd imagined her. Bethany slept much easier without the hairless boy staring in through her window. But by the time we found a new house halfway across town, the phantoms that had surrounded us our whole lives seemed like something out of a dream. You could tell that even Mom was letting herself breathe easier. So much of the oppression we'd felt growing up had stayed behind in that house, and leaving it was like lifting off a great heavy blanket that we'd never known was there. The years passed and we grew up. Bethany aced her classes and disappeared off to college somewhere across the country. I still had a few years of high school left in me, so... I took up some odd jobs here and there, hoping to build up a nest egg for my own college tuition. None of the jobs lasted very long. I had a hard time sitting still, always wanting to move on to bigger and better things. So I'd collect my paychecks and put in my notice and find something new to carry me forward. Eventually, I took up a morning paper route to make a little extra cash. This is a small town, out in the boonies, and they still use bicycle delivery boys to make the newspaper rounds. It was a thankless job, but I liked it. There was something freeing about zooming down the streets with the wind in your hair and the wagon full of papers clattering along behind you. It took me all over town, too. I liked getting the chance to explore all the nooks and crannies I 
I'd have never noticed otherwise. One of those nooks, though, I knew all too well. It was our old house. The place had sat empty for years, as if its reputation had cast a shadow over the building, warning buyers to stay away. The for sale sign had disappeared a long time ago, but I didn't know if someone had actually purchased the place or if our realtor had just taken it off the market. The house sat empty for years until one day, it suddenly wasn't. I pedaled past it on my paper route and saw a moving van parked in the driveway. A red-headed man in a garish maroon scarf directed the movers up the steps and into the house. In the second floor window, a woman's shadowy face stared out at the procession. I assumed it must have been his wife, or at least until another man came out of the house and kissed the redhead on the lips. The dark woman was gone when I looked up again. Jim and Rodney Fisher quickly earned a reputation in town. To be clear, Pacific Glade had absolutely no problem with gay people. The Fishers were just a notoriously reclusive couple. Anyone who tried to be friendly to them at the supermarket got the cold shoulder, and they'd ignore you if you waved to them on the street. Their next-door neighbor said they never answered their doorbell, even though she'd come over several times with a welcome-to-the-neighborhood casserole. I only saw them around a few times. They were on the scrawny side, almost a little sickly, and I wondered how much of that had to do with the house. Did the eyeless lady come and sit on their bed at night? Did the boy with no hair stare in through the window? Did the shadow ghost stalk through their halls, bringing hot tempers with it? I worried about them. Despite the aloof face they put on for the townsfolk, Jim had arrived in town wearing brightly colored clothing that almost made your eyes ache, but after two months in the house, his wardrobe had shrunk to a few black shirts and a pair of washed-out jeans. Clean-shaven Rodney developed patchy stubble on his face and deep bags under his eyes. I'd seen my parents slip into funks like this, and I didn't want the same thing to happen to the Fishers. But it wasn't my house anymore. There wasn't much I could do. The last time anyone saw the Fishers together was a morning in late April. They had stopped by the hardware store and picked up 12 cans of black paint before returning home. Their neighbor said she heard their front door closing, but by the time she walked onto her porch, the men themselves were nowhere to be seen. She didn't think much of it then. By the next morning, that opinion had drastically changed. She was waiting outside that day when I pedaled by with her paper. She cradled a cup of coffee in her hands and stared in bewilderment at the house next door. When I passed by it, I understood. Overnight, the Fishers had painted over every single window in their home with thick layers of black paint. The building, which had already been fairly grim before, now radiated darkness. Looking at it for too long made my skin crawl. I couldn't shake the sense that something was staring out at me from behind all that blackness. Gossip spread quickly around town, and everyone wondered what the bizarre paint job was all about. Had the fissures finally snapped? A few people speculated that it was all part of some freaky sex act like blackout curtains, but more excessive. Others thought it was symbolic. The couple had always secluded themselves from the rest of town. Maybe they really did want to be out of sight, out of mind. Everyone had a lot to say, but I didn't agree with any of their theories. They didn't know that house like I did. They hadn't grown up there. They hadn't seen the things I'd seen. They didn't know about the actual phantoms that haunted the property. The Fishers had painted over the windows from the inside, which meant that they were afraid of someone looking in. For the first time in years, I started having dreams about the eyeless woman. She would appear in the doorway of my bedroom. 
her blue dress flowing around her, and reach out a withered hand toward me. Her smile was as wide as ever. She never moved her lips, but I could hear a voice in my head. Soft, whispery, like wind blowing through the trees. Come home. I tried calling Bethany to talk about the dreams, but as soon as she heard me mention the old house, she hung up on me. I guess her own nightmares of the place were a little too fresh. I didn't want to mention them to Mom, either, in case it would dredge up all sorts of things she'd been trying to forget. So I kept the dreams to myself, letting them marinate. The paper route took me past the house every day. It quickly became clear that the fishers weren't bothering to pick up their papers, as the stack growing on their porch got larger and larger by the day. Sometimes I'd stop and ask the neighbor if she'd seen them, but I always got a shake of the head. She was worried. You could see it in her eyes. One morning, the neighbor wasn't out and about, and her car was gone from the driveway when I pedaled by. I later found out she'd gone to visit a sick relative in California. I should have kept on going, but something made me screech to a halt outside the old house. The black windows stared down at me, like a whole slew of empty eyes. My skin prickled with goosebumps. Come on, the eyeless lady whispered in my head. We used to keep a spare key under a loose rock in the front walkway, and the key was still there when I shimmied the rock free. I left my bike lying against the mailbox and approached the porch. Even the little window slits on the front door were painted over. For the first time, I noticed another blot of paint smearing the surface of the door. A few angry black streaks that looked almost like an eye. I should have turned and left right then, but that whispery voice was still calling me and my hand moved with a mind of its own. I stuck the key in the lock and turned. The front door clicked and swung open ever so slightly. I cast a nervous look around, then pushed the door open all the way and stepped inside. Hello? I called. Is anyone there? Walking into the front hall brought back such a rush of memories that I almost staggered. All the times mom would kiss me on the forehead as she sent me off to school. All the times I'd kicked off my shoes on the welcome mat before running off to play in my room. There were new pictures hanging on the walls, and the fishers had changed the wallpaper to a garish floral design, but it still felt like home. Somehow that fact scared me more than it comforted me. The lights were off, and when I tried the switch, there was a brief pop, then nothing. I flicked it a few more times before giving up. A pervasive heat had crept into the air as if the fissures had cranked up the thermostat, and it made me tug nervously at the collar of my shirt. Power outages and surges of heat in this house could only mean one thing. The shadow ghost was nearby. I continued down the hall, my footsteps creaking, and saw another painted eye. Then another. There were several of them, smeared at various heights along the wallpaper. I reached out and brushed my hand along one of them. My fingers came away with little flecks of dried paint. The wall itself was hot to the touch, and I couldn't help but remember my father on the day we'd found him, with those scorch marks crawling up his skin, like patches of spreading mold. The cluster of eyes grew thicker as I walked further into the house, forming an archway above the entrance to the den. There was no sunlight coming through the painted up windows so I could only rely on the light streaming through the front door to guide me. 
A faint smell reached my nostrils. A cloying smell, like roses mixed with sewage. I stepped into the den and waited for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. All the furniture had been removed, leaving the hardwood floor bare and empty. At first I thought the inner walls had been painted over completely black. But then, shapes emerged from the shadows. I saw that every square inch was covered with those angry painted eyes. They coalesced in a pure black path at the far end of the room, the paint smearing together into the loose shape of a doorway. There was a figure slumped on the ground in front of it. Every instinct in my body screamed for me to run, but I drew closer, my heart thumping heavily against my ribcage. The cloying smell grew stronger. In the darkness, I saw Jim's body slouched in a heap on the floor. His limbs were tangled together, and his eyes had been plucked from his skull leaving two bloody gaps that stared up at me vacantly. The air grew thicker. It almost seemed to coagulate. I had a hard time breathing in the sudden wave of heat. When I looked up from Jim's body, I saw a hallway stretching out before me where the painted doorway had been just seconds before. The walls were a solid ashen gray and there was a figure standing at the far end. Her blue dress fluttered in a wind I couldn't feel. The two little voids in her face pierced into my brain, and she reached out an ancient hand, like an old woman scattering crumbs to pigeons in the park. Come home, the eyeless lady whispered. My skin prickled with sweat. When I looked behind me, I saw a dark shape lurking in the entrance of the den, heat radiating from its outline in shimmery waves. It was the shadow ghost. It didn't step inside, didn't make any threatening moves toward me, but I could feel every cell in my body burning in its presence. I couldn't look at it for long. There was nothing else to look at, though, except Jim's slumped body and the wall of eyes and the long hallway with the beckoning woman at the end. I wondered if the hairless boy was here, too, staring in at me through the layers of thick black paint. I had the void before me and fire at my back. There was no way out of this room that didn't end in some horrible fate. I closed my eyes. Behind the safety of my eyelids, I tried to picture the house as I'd known it growing up. A dark place. A haunted place, but a home. A place where I could curl up in a cozy nook with my comic books. Where Bethany could study at the kitchen table. Where Mom could knit endlessly by the windows. Where Dad could sit on the sofa and watch his favorite game shows. I latched onto that image like a lifeline. Then, with my eyes still pressed shut, I turned and ran. I couldn't see the shadow ghost, but I could feel it as I plowed through the doorway. And for a horrible moment, I felt engulfed in flames. The peaceful images in my head were shoved aside by vicious memories of Dad smashing a beer bottle against the counter, of my parents shouting over each other from downstairs of Bethany and I cowered together and crying in my bedroom. I could blame a phantom for these memories, but I knew, deep down, that the worst ghosts in the house were the ones we'd created ourselves. Specters of hate and fear and sadness that would haunt these halls long after we were gone. The memories threatened to consume me, to drown me in their endless fire, but I clung to that one desperate image of my family at their best just existing 
just living together in that rare, precious moment of peace, and the tug of the shadow ghost lessened. I wrenched myself free and staggered down the hallway toward the light of the front porch. The air outside rushed into my burning lungs, cooling them, and I let out a strangled laugh of relief. I didn't look back. I just picked up my fallen bike and pedaled away, my legs rising and falling, my heart thumping a mile a minute. I could feel the house's hold on me, waning with each mile I put between us. I knew I would have to call the police. I knew that there would be questions about what I'd been doing in the house, but all of that could come later. For now, at least. I was free. Jim's death was ruled a murder. A ritualistic one, from the look of the painted eyes smeared everywhere inside. The police weren't able to find a single trace of Rodney. The prevailing theory around town was that he'd fled the state after murdering his partner. I suspected differently. I thought that the house had gotten its hooks into him. That when the eyeless lady had appeared at the end of her impossible hallway, Rodney had followed her beckoning hand. And the house had simply swallowed him up. If I had been just a little bit weaker, I might have shared his fate. I quit the paper route months ago, but I still bike past the place every so often. The house has been empty since the incident. The grass is overgrown and filled with all sorts of tangled weeds, and flecks are peeling from the outer walls. Its windows are still painted over, I can't tell if anyone's staring out from inside, but deep down, I know the ghosts are still there. I think they'll always be there. Last week, I passed the house again, and this time I saw another moving van in the driveway. A harried-looking mother and father carried furniture up the front steps, while two small children laughed and darted through the grass. There was a third face peering out from around the corner of the house. A young boy with no hair and a round, egg-like skull. But he ducked away when he saw me looking. The new family has already started tidying up the place, scraping the windows clean and trimming the untamed front lawn. They've even started putting out Halloween decorations. There are huge cobwebs stretched across the front porch, and a stuffed scarecrow sits on a rocking chair in the yard. It's wearing a black dress and a witch's hat. I don't like that it doesn't have eyes. I can hear the faintest of whispers every time I bike past it. The new occupants of the house may be settling in, but its old occupants, the ones that haunted me my entire childhood, are still there too. I know it's only a matter of time before the sun starts seeing an eyeless lady perched on the foot of his bed, before the daughter starts complaining of a boy with no hair peeking through her window. Even the parents will notice the shadow ghost before long. The house is like a doomsday clock, and their hours are ticking by. I don't know these folks. What happens in the walls of their home shouldn't be my business, but I still feel a sense of obligation, that I should protect them, that I should keep their story from mirroring my own. Too many bonds have been tested by that house. Too many families have been damaged beyond repair. It's time to break the cycle. I don't know what I can do to stop the hauntings. All those phantoms... All the ones we made and all the ones that came before us will be tough to exercise. Maybe impossible, but I'm going to try, damn it. I'm going to do for them what no one could do for us. I'll be their guardian. And maybe, if I'm lucky, I can make that house a home again.
As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. This next story was sent in by Kayla Lindsay. It's, well, I don't want to give anything away, but it will definitely have you reconsidering using any free samples you get in the mail. This is The Pink Boxes. The mail room of my apartment complex was busy as people check their mail after work. A woman, a neighbor from the third floor I recognized and had greeted a few times, was staring inside her mailbox. As I approached, she saw me and asked, Did you both get these? She was around my age, skin red from the chilly wind outside, lips chapped. She pulled a pink box out of her mailbox to show me. It was tied with a ribbon. I'm asking because there's no to or from address on it. Might be some kind of promotion. I looked around the mailroom as I dug through my bag for my keys. The neighbor waited on me, watching me watch others. I watched as two of my other neighbors opened their mailboxes too. The female neighbor pulled out the same pink box from her mailbox. The male neighbor only pulled out some plain envelopes, shuffled through them, and walked out, apparently not attentive to the question in the air. The female neighbor must have overheard the question as she held up the pink box to us. Both neighbors watched me pull out my keys and open my mailbox. In the mailbox was a pink box. I picked it up, and the box itself felt smooth and cool. The ribbon holding the two pieces together was satin. It wasn't a heavy box, but it wasn't insubstantial either. The two women came to stand near me, flanking me as if conspiratorial. No address? No address, I replied. What is it? The woman on the left said, I heard someone talking about it at work. She sells skin products for this company, MLM style. Apparently, the skin company is mailing these samples out to people, trying to drum up some business. It doesn't seem random. I bet everyone is getting them. Not sure, though. Could just be a few places. They must have spent a ton of money doing that if it's sent out to everyone. The woman on the right said, sliding her nails underneath the ribbon of her package. I wonder if this stuff is any good. <laughs> yeah, I'm not putting this on my face until I look it up, said the woman on the left. Though, to be honest, my skin is so dry. Maybe it's good. I'm sick of buying a million face things, right side woman said. I do like free stuff. The three of us looked at each other and shrugged. The two women headed up the squeaky wooden staircase in silence, thinking to themselves. This was the most I had ever spoken with my neighbors, and off we all went in our separate ways again. I doubted I would hear the results of their skincare adventure. I looked around and saw a few others get their mail, all the women getting boxes and some of the men pulling out boxes as well. The box itself was a pretty pink shade, millennial pink, they call it. 
The trendy font on the top looked professionally designed. Definitely a company with money. I recognized the name. I had seen a few friends on social media posting about it, trying to sell it. MLM style indeed. I had scrolled through so quickly that I hadn't thought too hard about the results of the product themselves. I had heard that MLM sellers weren't actually that successful and struggled in debt for years trying to sell their massive store products to the same family and friends. So I thought the idea that some enterprising seller in our apartment building or even our city had given up her social media blitzes and had just put them in our mailboxes. Not sure of how she did that, but it wasn't unheard of. I turned the box around in my hands to find any other signs of origin. The back of the box read, This is the miracle you need. Use the makeup remover first, then the face wash, then moisturizer. Go to our website for more. The website was listed. In my apartment, I set the box on my kitchen counter and opened the fridge. I opened my half-drunk bottle of wine and poured it into a mug as I unlocked my phone screen. I was set on doing some research on this box. I opened my browser on my phone and looked up the company name. Skin Care. The website came up in the same pink, same font as the note on the box. There wasn't much to explore on the site itself, just two tabs. The store tab just said, coming soon, with nothing listed. So, this was a promo for a burgeoning company, I suspected. The testimonials tab included a long list of raving reviews by some beauty influencers that I vaguely recognized. Probably paid for the review, I thought cynically. And a long scrolling set of reviews from people I assumed to be the leading sellers of the products. I was still unsure if it was just my apartment building or if it was a broader reach. Turns out women all over my social media were posting about the box. Some with more time at home during the day had already used the products from the box. Maybe I was just too cynical about the whole thing. They didn't seem skeptical at all. Their skin was already glowing. The word is irresistible. I finished off my glass of wine and poured another. Picking up the box, I slid the ribbon off the edge, relishing the beautiful texture of the ribbon in the box. Staring at one's face in the mirror before trying a new product is an exercise in critique. What thing is wrong with my skin that I never realized before? I wore makeup, but I could see that it was wearing off and that my skin tone was uneven. My skin texture needed some work, as the bumps along my forehead showed. Dark eye circles, caused probably by my habit of a bottle of wine each night, though that couldn't be helped through skincare products. Might as well try. I opened the box and pulled out the makeup remover. The small bottle felt as silky and luxurious as the box it came in. I splashed it on a cotton ball and dragged the damp cotton across my face. I ran my fingers across my face when I finished. Greasy, a bit, but smoother than it was this morning when I felt my clean face. Then the face wash. Again, a nice clean finish. Then the moisturizer. I rubbed the silky gel between my fingers before putting it on my face. My skin felt cool, but not tingly or burning as some cooling gels feel. Fresh. Looking in the mirror, I saw that my skin looked smoother and cleaner than it normally does. Another glass of wine and some trash TV. Instead of cooking a pleasant dinner and cleaning the house as I had planned, I nodded off to sleep on the couch. I woke up with a start. Checking my phone screen, it was 10 p.m. Immediately, I felt my face pulsing, almost like my skin was at one second too loose and the next second too tight. Did I already have a hangover? Should have had more water to drink. I shuffled to the bathroom and flipped on the light and gasped. Covering my face were tiny indentions, Almost like my pores had expanded slightly and then deepened a little. Little craters all over my face. I ran my shaking, hot hands over my skin and could feel how my skin cratered and rose under my fingertips. I splashed my face with water, trying hard not to get any in my gasping mouth. My heart was pounding in my chest and my ears. 
I could feel my whole insides tighten and release with fear. My belly full of wine sloshed to the point of spilling over into my mouth and guts. The water didn't make my skin feel any better or worse, and my skin didn't change. Still pitted all over. I stared at myself as my mind scrambled to make some sense. I was dull from the booze and panic. I sucked in air. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe. 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 I picked up my phone. A spot of blood dropped onto the screen. I looked up into the mirror. Blood was starting to pull up from one pore, then another. Just a little pinprick amount of blood. I touched the blood coming up from my skin. It was changing so fast. So much faster than it must have taken to form the craters in the first place. Screaming. Coming from another room. Another place. It felt so close to me. Everything felt so close. The scream was not from my own mouth. Another scream. A different one. Far away, but still close. My neighbors. I couldn't stop touching my face. I focused on one pit. My fingernail started to sink into the crater. Blood was on the tip of my finger, red and fresh. They were getting deeper, deeper. I put my phone on my bathroom sink before I vomited in the trash can next to me. Blood dripped ever so slightly faster from my face. I turned to my phone. 911. Busy. More muffled screaming. Now, some crying just beyond my apartment walls. It's not just me. 911 was still busy. All of us calling our only hotline at once. I picked up my phone. My hands now slick with sweat. One social media site was down. The other laggy. I tripped over my carpet as I scrambled to the living room. Blood was streaming down my face, onto my chest, onto my arms. The blood was running faster with the blend of my own tears. I scream. Vomit is trapped in my throat. I turned on my TV and pressed the button on the side of the TV through a few channels to find the news. The news anchor was a man. His skin, sickly, pale. Still not much is known about the outbreak. Doctors are advising that if you are still struggling with skin problems, you should remain in your house. Call 911. Experts are advising to not touch others because we do not know if this is contagious or not at the moment. I repeat, stay in your home. I paced around the house, running to check on my skin in the bathroom, watching it bleed. Weeping blood now, the pits growing deeper, my skin pulsing, moving, expanding, contracting. I hear the anchor man in the background. We are starting to hear sources say that they can trace the skin outbreak with a line of skin products called Skin Care. This popular line exploded in popularity and had vast social media promotions over the last day. Sources say that if you're using the Skin Care line, seize all use of it immediately. Call the provided customer service number below. A number flashed on the ticker below the man. What now? My voice shook into the emptiness of my apartment. Blood on my hands. Blood on my floors. People say they are experiencing symptoms such as extreme itching and burning. Some are complaining of small indentions in their facial skin. More extreme symptoms include vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, bloody stool and urine, dehydration, weakness, and fainting. I fumbled with my phone now streaked with blood and tears. I called the line. I waited for five minutes as the phone rang and rang, my eyes fixed on the TV, the anchor's voice in the background. A woman answered. 
Hello? Thank you for calling Skincare Customer Service Hotline. We value your call. How may I help you? My skin is bleeding. I shuddered, surprised I had managed to speak. Oh, yes. You are on your way to the next stage. Tell me how to fix this! You can't, she said in a well-mannered phone voice. This is what is supposed to happen. Then what about the people who started this regimen before me? They are in the final stage. You are in the normal process. Stay calm. The anchorman's voice. Dermatologists are saying to stop the regimen. Do not use any of the products. I hung up on the woman. One of the social media sites finally came up. Every post was related to the products. Friends, family, all bleeding, bleeding, and skin splitting, skin full of holes. The pictures... God. The pictures were horrifying. The videos... Skin pulsing, bleeding, holes, full of holes. I once saw a lotus pod, full of large holes that seemingly went to the bottom of the pod to make space for seeds that had once nestled there. Some of the posts were from men, men who had taken photos of themselves or the women they loved. Holes. I could see one picture of a woman who had died. Skin poked through to her skull. But the skin was so full of holes and so covered with blood that I could barely see the depths. Unless I looked so closely. The closer I looked, the more despair rose in my belly. I went to Skincare's own social media page. They had posted five minutes before. The post read, If you are experiencing some skin complaints, please be assured that we are aware of the complaints. Your skin will continue to pit, and you will die. When you die, the holes in your skin will release what is inside. We appreciate your cooperation. I looked in the mirror. I could hear the increasingly strained voice of the TV anchorman talking behind me. Skin full of holes. Holes! There are holes in people's skin! He began to read the statement by the skincare company. The exact thing I had read online. My skin was also full of holes. The bottoms of the skin pits were starting to open to show the red and darkness through them. The holes opening into my body, through my skin. I could feel something moving under my skin. could feel it trying to surface through the holes. Just a little bit. As if whatever it was, was waiting until the right time to push up through the holes. It was not time yet. I could feel resistance at the bottom of the holes in my face. Something moving against my skull. Something is coming. I hope I'm not alive to see it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this week's stories, and it's time for Patreon shoutouts. This week's patrons are Joanne Harrison, Dinosaur Lady, Denise Leverow, Zach Smith, Amanda Lewis, Raul Enriquez, and Jen Weeks. Thank you so, so much, you guys. I'm sending you all so much love and happiness. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you have a story you'd like considered for the show, you can send it to scarytosleep at gmail.com. You can follow the show on Twitter, Tumblr, Reddit, Instagram, and Facebook. Remember, by supporting my sponsors and using my offer codes, you're supporting my show. All right, everyone, until we meet again, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams.